All right. Uh, so this is basically uh, not just a hypothetical scenario. This actually happens quite a lot. And uh, most of the material that you find here is condensed. I mean, there's a lot more detail that ought to be said here, which I can't because this itself is like a several hour talk. Yeah. So what I will just try to go about doing is, uh, is first jump into definitions. Uh, so when we come back and say fix, uh, it, it, it has a very different meaning. Uh, the first, the meaning that we have uh, in our head when we use word fix uh, is hacking. Uh, and hacking is not what most of the people think it is. Uh, it's about basically getting a one-up advantage or changing a particular outcome, the way in which we wanted, not as a certainty, but as a probability. Uh, so one way to think about how uh, the definition here matters is that uh, if you basically take a coin and say that, look, it's head or tail 50-50, but what if you just basically tilt uh, the coin such that the probability of you getting ahead is 70? Uh, it is not really fixing in terms of fixing immediately, but it is basically ensuring that if you play the game long enough, uh, you would actually get a much higher advantage compared to your opponent. That is exactly how you have to think about the word fixing and hacking here. And that is exactly what uh, you see in India on elections. Uh, basically, uh, the way in which they are run uh, and the way in which it is being operated uh, now uh, of late uh, essentially gives a very unfair advantage, right, uh, to some party, and essentially gives a very un uh, put the other party in a very difficult situation. So, the, so the, the question that you then have to ask is like unfair for whom? Uh, the answer here is unfair for voters and unfair for the opposition parties. Uh, and then how do you ensure that this unfair advantage comes? Uh, the answer is by creating asymmetries. So that is really the definitional uh, aspect of uh, what we need to talk about now, right? So moving forward, uh, there are three fundamental ways in which you can create these asymmetries. Uh, uh, and all these asymmetries are linked together and they feed off each other. Uh, so the first uh, information asymmetry that you have is information itself. And then there are institutional asymmetries and which creates resource asymmetries. I mean, so if you, if you look back and think about what these asymmetries fundamentally means is that they tilt the uh, election um, lay of the land itself uh, much more towards the incumbent and very little uh, and much worse towards the uh, voter uh, and with, with a particular outcome uh, when, when the game is being played long enough. That's the way in which you have to think about it, right? Look forward. Uh, so what, what does informational asymmetry mean in the context of how, to, uh, how the election game is being played? Uh, so if you understand a fair contract, a fair contract is where uh, of the parties who enter into the contract uh, have all information about each other. Uh, in an unfair contract, um, what, ha what, ha what happens is like one party knows much, much more about the other party. And, and that is what we call as informational asymmetry as. So if you, if you take an example of the stock market, uh, you come back and say insider trading is banned or at least illegal uh, because uh, the insiders by being the very nature of insiders have much more information than what is going on with the stock compared to any other outside parties. Uh, so information asymmetries in general are not looked upon very nicely and there are various laws in place in order to ensure that it doesn't play too much. Uh, but, but in the case of elections, strangely, you will find that information asymmetry is never even talked about. Right. And uh, now let's take this information asymmetry problem into the voting, pro voting issue. Uh, the voting is essentially a three party problem uh, where there is an incumbent, opposition, and an voter. And um, like it or not, uh, the way in which the election works is that uh, the voter has to choose between the incumbent and the opposition uh, when the elections are held. Uh, it really doesn't matter whether uh, the opposition is one party or many parties, or it doesn't really matter if the incumbent is again one party or many parties, there is the same problem. And, and so in the, in the way in which elections come nowadays work, information asymmetry ensures that the incumbent has a very, very higher advantage uh, compared to the opposition. And the opposition also has a better advantage in a noter. So if you, if you fundamentally take this problem and break it down, this is how the greater greater sign kind of a thing works in the sense that uh, the incumbent also has a much better advantage. So how does, the, how does an operator ensure that the incumbent has a much higher information asymmetry? Let's dive deep into that. Uh, so yeah, so the first interesting part about building an information asymmetry uh, is to build more databases. 
Uh, that is not a surprise for people who have been uh, doing this kind of work for a very long time, but it may actually come across a surprise for many others. It's always about building more databases. Uh, the step two is to merge, share, and analyze them. And uh, that part is also pretty uh, obvious for operators. Uh, and, and I'll explain more about what it means. Uh, the step three is uh, deny access to databases about yourself. Uh, so let us think about how step three works. Now, typically the way in which democracies are supposed to work uh, is that regime change happens every X number of years. In some democracies, it's three years, some it's four years, some it's five years, uh, whatever the number is. Uh, but most of the democracies are designed to create what we call as regime change. And the regime change uh, every happens in a particular cadence. And the way in which the re information regime change works is that you are supposed to decide as, as a country, as an order, what is good for your country based on whatever uh, metrics that you choose about. And in most of the democracies, people like to get uh, rich or at least not poor. So they have a general sense of direction about uh, how to go forward uh, as a country or how to go backward as a country or whatever. And then they basically vote based on that, right? I mean, that's typically the operating theory. So in this aspect, if you look at it, uh, Com uh, commentators would come back and say, in general, if you are uh, leading the country towards prosperity, where feeling people are feeling a sense of direction, growth, happiness, incomes are growing, uh, in and this and they call it indicators. Uh, and there are quite a lot of indicators about uh, these. Uh, some are high frequency, some are low frequency, some are uh, much uh, frequently published, some are uh, much less frequently published, and so on and so on. Uh, so this is basically the state of just not the economy, but the state of the country. Uh, so in general, when voters are supposed to make decisions about whether to vote their incumbent in or the opposition in, uh, they need data. And the government actually has quite a lot of data about itself uh, or, or whoever is a ruling party has quite a lot of data about itself. Uh, so when you want to build an information asymmetry, which ensures the level playing field is tilted towards it, the incumbent typically does not give access to any data about its own performance, right? I mean, that is usually step three. Uh, and then once you go uh, into that mode in step four, you fundamentally try to uh, tilt the level playing field uh, by what we call as narrative control via targeted messaging. I'll go back to that. Uh, there is a very fixed process of doing narrative control. Um, and I'll explain more uh, to the extent time allows on that. And in step five, what you have is uh, you have institution control to entrench. Um, and then, uh, so if you look for the steps very sequentially, and uh, it basically goes into a loop, uh, you start off with building one database, you go and move to two, then three and four, at somewhere along the line, an inflection point comes, at which point of time, the institutions that you have created essentially work in your favor more and more, thus essentially entrenching uh, your advantage for a very long, long, long time. Uh, that is how you build information asymmetry uh, at an institutional level. Uh, it, it is harder to spot when it starts, uh, just like how you see the COVID waves not being able to uh, be spotted when it, when it was like st starting, but it multiplies and multiplies and multiplies at some point of time, the inflection point after which it's impossible for you to push back or very difficult for you to push back. Uh, this is basically how information asymmetry is a process box. Yeah, uh, let's go forward. Okay, so before we go into step one uh, about why building more databases uh, is very important, uh, there are some fundamental uh, e-governance laws uh, that you need to understand about building databases. And uh, these are not flippantly written stuff. Uh, these are, this is actually what most of the people actually believe. Yeah, so, uh, so the first and foremost rule in e-governance says that every problem can be solved by building a database eventually. Uh, that is the part that I skipped out. Uh, and if you fundamentally take the problem of building any database, uh, be it uh, PAN numbers or being a voter ID or be it whatever, uh, the first and foremost issue that they have is, uh, at least in the modern world, when we see database, it is not good old paper and pen kind of a thing, it's modern digital databases. Uh, building databases is a very hard and expensive procedure. Uh, and you typically try to build them using uh, capital infused uh, by the government uh, via subsidies. And uh, in general, because government is usually considered poor, you take the cheapest and the most viable option. It really doesn't matter what collateral damage you cause by doing that. 
uh, because without that, no uh, database will ever get built, and hence you would never uh, succeed in the long run, and hence you would take whatever corner cutting that you do, no matter what the consequences are, right? And and that is fundamentally because of the way in which uh, the government subsidy becomes like a bottling factor uh, in building a long-term database of any kind, right? And then what you then do is uh, it is just not sufficient for you to build it. Uh, you have to somehow operate them. And uh, however, operating them is an operational expenditure via public-private partnerships uh, with shared revenue model and capital appreciation. So I'll come back to it. And uh, let's think through uh, some of the interesting databases that we had built in the recent past, uh, which people had great difficulty and trouble with uh, even after so many years. Uh, the first and foremost is the GST database, uh, which of course, uh, everyone who ever files uh, or runs a business and file returns is familiar about and the kind of issues that it has been talked about, um, about you having to log in into the middle of the night and not working and so on and so on. Uh, a similar episode played out in the MCA database, which not many people were aware of. Uh, a similar issue of very recently that passed out uh, was basically the income tax pan database with a new portal and stuff like that. Uh, and so in essence, you have to really start wondering about uh, how hard it is to create a database of pan numbers and how hard it is to create a database of just income tax returns. Um, and uh, collect tax filings. So in general, if you notice, uh, the government is pretty uh, good at only doing one thing, which is collecting money. And you really got to wonder if it is so, so hard to run and maintain databases that collect money from citizens, which is the primary job of any government, how hard it is to, for it to maintain and run other databases at scale. Uh, it turns out that it is way beyond its competence. So what it normally does it is, is that it either uh, creates a shell organization or gives it to uh, Elven bidding and so on and so on. And no matter the operational route it takes, uh, it is always a public-private partnership. Um, sometimes it's a shared revenue model, sometimes it's a fixed cost model, um, and sometimes with VC funding, uh, uh, creating uh, digital economy kind of a thing, et cetera, et cetera. That is how it has always been with e-governance. Yeah? Uh, the, 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 the fourth rule of e-governance is utility and accuracy increases with use. Well, again, use the word law, it is not a certainty. That is really the belief. So the way in which you should, I should have probably written as e-governance beliefs, but that is what they believe as laws. Um, and so, so we, we are basically understand that. Uh, so the, the primary here is uh, why is this utility and accuracy increases with use thing came because if, if it fails often, people would shout, and if it, people shout often, uh, someone would basically beat up someone and then essentially ensure that uh, the, the accuracy and utility over a period of time increases. I mean, of course, you could argue about the fact that, well, power matters here. Uh, yes, it does, but this is what they believe, right? And of course, the last thing is use can be incentivized or coerced, which is another way of saying uh, that uh, either you pay people for it or they will be coerced to use it because there is no choice. Um, and, and so here is the interesting thing about uh, coercion. Uh, when people are coerced um, and they are not incentivized, the system basically gets marooned out of incentives in the sense that uh, because you're coerced, no matter what, uh, there is no market kind of an exit option. And because there is no market exit option, you have no choice then to put up with the inanities that the system demands. And so number four, the law number four of e-governance, the utility and accuracy increases with use, actually works in reverse uh, when coercion is involved. Uh, when coercion is involved, utility and accuracy actually decreases with use and the system falls apart. And uh, what you have no choice than to keep up with the system because that is the price of living. I mean, unfortunately, that is how it works. So in this model, if you can understand very clearly, it is very visible that any system that has a mandatory opt-in with no opt-out, uh, will always over a period of time encounter issues because uh, its service quality will never improve. Uh, it will just keep falling apart, falling apart, falling apart, falling apart. And uh, that is something that uh, will create more further problems for anyone who implements a system. Uh, but that, that is how it is, yeah? So this is the, the, fu the fundamental of how you build databases uh, when it comes to India, because these are, these are observations that have been, I've just basically made them as, told them as laws, right? Uh, so let's talk about databases in the context of elections. Uh, there are quite a lot of databases uh, in this country uh, because we, we have pre prioritized building databases over service quality in the last decade or so. Uh, so let us think back about um, what kind of databases are available. Um, so the first is an auto ID databases. I mean, it typically has name, EPIC number, 
um, mobile number, date of birth, state district, constituency, polling booth, and even other numbers. Uh, because the ECI did quite a lot of linking uh, even before the 2015 law came. And even after that, it did quite a lot of linking. Um, and then they, they do a lot of cross-linking either uh, without telling people. Uh, I mean, the consequence of that was seen in the Telangana elections on 2018, I think. Um, then there are quite a lot of other databases, uh, which we call beneficiary databases. Uh, there are quite a few of them. Uh, but in general, they have cash legion, mobile number, bank accounts, other number, and so on and so on. Uh, then the, the third kind of database is actually from the private sector. These are basically telecom databases and bank databases um, and other kind of databases. Uh, they also have name, date of, date of birth, mobile numbers, email IDs, ID card numbers of various kinds and other numbers. Uh, then there are other databases that trade separately in the market, uh, which we call as the other mobile databases. Uh, then there are student databases, uh, club databases, hotels, entry registers, exit registers, and so on and so on. Uh, so if you if you look back about all these databases, uh, most of these databases are available uh, to you uh, if you know where to look for, or you can buy them. Uh, for instance, uh, if you look at the voter ID databases, uh, people have been uh, scraping and scrounging voter ID databases for quite a long time um, using various techniques. Um, but off late, uh, there is no such notion of private and public field in these databases in the sense that there may be something hidden, uh, but you can always get them if you know where to get from, right? Uh, a similar thing happens even in beneficiary databases. Uh, beneficiary databases are also available in the market if you look for it. Uh, we, uh, uh, me and my uh, co-author Shivam, uh, who collaborate on this, uh, have tracked quite a lot of databases that are being traded in the market. Uh, you can buy them off in masse, uh, particularly when elections are coming. Uh, well, the accuracy is something that you have to determine over a period of time, but these are always available for a song. Yeah, um, the, the, the value goes up during election times and comes down later. Um, and in the, in the interesting part about these databases is that uh, you can also get them directly from the state hubs uh, or you can get from partners. I mean, there are various ways in which you can get them, uh, uh, which I will not go much into, but that is how it is. Uh, the telecom databases are interesting uh, in the sense that uh, there is quite a lot of uh, uh, places where you can find telecom database. Uh, these are typically uh, sold by uh, operators uh, who are manning these stations or sometimes there was vulnerability on those things which allows them to do a massive scrapping um, and so on and so on. Uh, similarly, there are other databases uh, which, do, uh, which are also treated and every time a data breach happens, uh, there are operators who basically accumulate these databases uh, and, and uh, clean them up to some extent, do some mixing and matching and sell it off for a higher value. Uh, so this is the fundamental problem uh, when it comes to uh, uh, fixing elections or hacking elections as an electoral hacking, as we call it, uh, where you get to access a lot of databases. And what this database actually tells when mixed and matched uh, with people uh, is that it can reveal a lot about how a voter votes, right? Uh, and what can sway the voter. Uh, that's what it is, right? Uh, step two, uh, once you have access to all the databases, uh, whether you procure them or you get them directly, it really doesn't matter. Uh, you are supposed to do merge share and analyze. Uh, and the process of merge share analysis works uh, by having a common identifier across all these databases. Uh, one of the most commonly used identifiers uh, are actually mobile numbers and other numbers. And uh, if you look at mobile numbers, uh, it, is, it is actually a pretty priced asset in information control. Uh, and uh, it is fundamentally enabled by uh, this OTP uh, each that India has got, uh, where for no matter, even if you want to buy a milk uh, from Big Basket or any of those places, you have to give them a num mobile number. And uh, uh, you want to go buy uh, exercise equipment and some uh, exercise shop, they will ask you for a mobile number. You go, you're you going to go buy Tatkari in some place, they will ask you a mobile number and so on and so on. So what fundamentally happens is that, that uh, a mobile number is basically like a static identifier, which uh, everyone gets uh, a lot. So when you try to do a mixing and matching of databases this is one thing that they use as a common identifier, right? Uh, but the hard problem about mobile numbers when it comes to elections and voting is that uh, unlike most, uh, we have noticed on the field that mobile numbers change and recycle a lot, uh, but other numbers don't recycle at the same rate. Uh, so when we basically say don't, remember we are talking about this abstract idea called rate of change. Uh, uh, quite a lot of people's mobile numbers change uh, if, they, if they belong to a particular economic strata. 
And as you go higher and higher and higher on the economic strata, your mobile numbers don't change. Uh, this is uh, empirical observation on the field. Uh, so if you go back and look at one of the things that I actually track, uh, uh, this is called as a mobile and other number uh, linked databases, uh, which, which uh, if you basically go back and look at it, uh, when there were many telecom operators, the accuracy is about 15% to 10%. Uh, what it means is that uh, the database that you get and the database that it is actually linked to uh, don't actually have a match uh, because the numbers recycle a lot. Uh, as the telecom vendors uh, become a duopoly or tripoly or whatever it is uh, you call it, the accuracy has increased now up to 25 to 30%. Um, and uh, the, the accuracy again goes higher uh, with economic strata, but that is how it is, right? Uh, so what is the next step? Uh, so when people come and say, but uh, apart from dark databases, uh, trade market, et cetera, et cetera, uh, how are these databases shared? Um, sometimes you simply ask them, uh, but there are two public case studies uh, that we I want to discuss about. Uh, one is the one is the Seva Mitra app that uh, TDP made uh, in Andhra uh, in the last elections. I mean, it is a public source. Uh, you can, uh, I will probably click and go back to it or probably not required. Uh, so if you look back at the Seva Mitra app, what they did is they basically got a full dump of the uh, state database hub uh, from Andhra. Uh, and, and remember the public architecture here about the state data hub. Uh, it is basically another database uh, which various in some frequent updates on top of which uh, every state run beneficiary database is linked with it. So in essence, what has happened here is a political party, which was actually running the government, uh, was able to ensure that all the data that the government had in its state data hub uh, was leaked uh, to the political party, but not to the opposition. And so this became like a big issue. Uh, so one thing that uh, kind of uh, people got very interested about is, uh, is, is, is about color photos and, and whatnot. Uh, and so uh, cadres basically walk road by road, street by street, collecting numbers and databases, um, and uh, whether they are pulling both link, et cetera, et cetera. So the Seva Mitra app, if you look at it, uh, had databases uh, from the uh, state government, uh, had scheme database, uh, then they had uh, voting ID list, because that is always made available to the political parties. Then there was uh, street to street surveys, the way they walk around and figure out uh, which is where, and there was an app made for it, and there was an analysis made for it. Uh, the UID have been admitted it uh, and said it was stolen, but they never wanted to tell about how it is stolen, uh, but and no one ever investigated it after that, right? Uh, so this is the first case case study. Uh, the second public case study was was on uh, Pondicherry, uh, the recently concluded elections, where uh, there were a bunch of activists who basically gave uh, linked their other numbers to a mobile phone, which they did not uh, give it to anywhere else. And before they know it, uh, it they were getting uh, uh, chat, what, uh, WhatsApp chat group invitations for those mobile numbers. And so the Madras High Court investigated it uh, through all the URDA's uh, uh, response as not sufficiently good enough. And it ordered an investigation. And it just so happened that the judge who was basically on the bench, uh, who was the chief justice of Madras High Court, got transferred uh, for reasons no one knows about. Uh, so this, in a sense, is basically what you're looking at uh, in the sense that for all practical purpose, an incumbent uh, fundamentally has access to uh, an incumbent party, not the government, because those two are supposed to be different, has fundamentally has access to all information about you. Um, and uh, we'll go uh, further on uh, how the, what it means for uh, the secret ballot itself. Um, and so, so just think about what I told you so far. Uh, databases can be bought, databases can be traded, databases can be given, or databases can be taken. And this is because of step one, right? And uh, of course, if you go back, uh, what is the step three I talked about on how to fix an election as an operator? Uh, you had to deny access to databases about yourself, which is fundamentally about government performance and what they are doing and where is the money. I mean, all the usual stuff that you call yourself as democracy. Uh, there are several recent examples. I will not go much into it. Uh, so the first was, was about the NSO survey, uh, where uh, there was an internal survey which from the statistical organization which said um, we had the worst unemployment in the last 40 years, and it was never released. And uh, the, the principal uh, statistical scientist resigned um, over that and it got leaked. 
uh, there were several changes in RTA Act, which fundamentally ensures that citizens have accountability uh, towards uh, democracies, um, which in, which nowadays now uh, come back to most of the time as not no data available, not requested exemption. So those things have increased quite a lot. Uh, and then the, the there is also quite a bit of controversies on the GDP backdated stuff. Uh, where the methodology is being questioned, whether uh, growth is being really growth and so on and so on. So what you now have is uh, at step three, uh, more data about voters uh, and less data about the government. That's really what you're looking at, right? Um, and step four, uh, this is the, this is the uh, interesting part about uh, targeted messaging and analysis. Uh, so what you do here is that uh, at the end of every election, polling booth data is available. Uh, so in the past, when uh, there were physical ballots that were being used or before the EVMs came in, uh, they would basically take all the ballot papers, uh, put it in the central uh, counting place and mix it up. And uh, this is in the form of anonymization. So what it really means is that, that uh, since there is no polling data available at a booth level, you can't do targeted analysis and, and, or analytics. And of course, in those days, there's no such huge databases. So the very speed, uh, problem and the analog problem of paper has fundamentally made democracy stronger. And people have, have really not understood the extent of that. Uh, because if you have paper and you have less databases, your democracy is much stronger because uh, it is very difficult for the political party to have voting uh, information about yourself. But of course, you can always question uh, in the modern day services, digitization and all is required. But, but, but the thing that really uh, is important about digitization is, uh, we can still do a lot of targeted prediction based on polling booth data because even after EVMs, uh, polling data at every EVM is actually published out, right? So what it really allows is it allows a lot of mathematical techniques to be used uh, for predictions because remember, I have a lot more data about you than you about me. Uh, so the first thing is what they normally do is uh, they assign this uh, thing called a panapramo. Uh, Panapramukh is a very old construct. Uh, my dad used to be a polling worker uh, on 1960s, maybe. Um, and it was as old as that. I remember him telling me about uh, doing uh, uh, poll, poll booth working uh, then. And the way in which it works is that you take a voter uh, database or voter list, as they call it in those days, you print them on a piece of paper, or you do cyclo style in the old days. And let's say there were 500 people on a polling booth. Um, and then you take 50 at a time, uh, and then you say that this 50 person, tell me what is the leaning. I mean, so the panna is a page, um, you assign the one worker of the party uh, whose job is to basically figure out uh, the, the people whom he is responsible for, what are their leanings, okay? So this is how it used to be even on the paper side. Uh, so nothing new about it, you may say, but let's go back further, right? So what you do is uh, you just basically mark down leanings. Uh, in the olden days, it used to be leanings based on um, uh, whether he's a member and caste and so on and so on. Uh, that's the same thing exists even now. And then, but in the modern day, what you do is you do uh, statistical analysis and you can do markov analysis and so on and so on. You, you start with the prior and you say assign a probability. And then when the data comes back after the poll, you adjust. And so what, you, what you're doing in this process is that uh, your probability of what the voter is going to vote and their leanings uh, is actually getting much more sophisticated over a period of time, right? Um, and uh, so I'll give a very small example uh, with what I call as a three voter problem because it's much easier for you to understand. You just have to extend it uh, mathematically to n voter problem, but it's essentially the same, right? So you take a polling booth, let us say there are three voters in it. Um, and then we just took about uh, two parties. Uh, there's voter one, there's voter two, and then there's voter three. And uh, the way in which analysis process works is that uh, you write down the leanings and you say, what is the probability this person is gonna vote for me? And then uh, you do what is called as an expectation analysis. And, and so here, what you do is you write it down and say, okay, uh, it really doesn't matter what party I'm actually being given as a polling booth consultant. I just say one is BGP, one is INC, and one is neutral. And uh, depending on which party I'm working on, I'm gonna say that no matter what, the net result of this polling booth data is one by three, right? Um, so at this point of time, uh, the way in which targeted messaging works uh, is that uh, you do something like this, right? Uh, you basically now get access to a whole lot of databases. Remember that is step one and step two. So you start writing like this. You say leanings, you write, I mean, is this person getting a subsidy in MN Riga? Is this, is this person getting LPG subsidy? Is he getting a Kizan subsidy? Is he getting a scholarship custody? What is his caste, right? 
and then you write down all the meanings and then you come back and say now what right uh, in order to win uh, you only have three options uh, the option number one is to sway the neutral to vote for you uh, the option number two is suppress the opponent uh, the option number three is make your uh, linear uh, the person whom you lean to vote out so it is this is what is called as a uh, get out of vote campaign right and uh, so if you look back what this allows is it allows you to do custom crafting of messages you can come back and say well vote for me because you got so much of scholarship from you vote for me because i gave you so much of mn raga or you come back and say to the other person vote for me because uh, maybe i'll give you higher reservation for your cost or in order to ensure the other person uh, suppress uh, you just basically spread information uh, that uh, Uh, oh, he's not an Amendra person. So, what kind of crafted messaging can I send him, right? Um, and then you, you, you. So, remember, at this point of time, uh, the features that I've written out, what is called Amendra Ga, LPG Kisan, Scholarship Cash, uh, are only mere markers. Uh, a, a typical op campaign may probably have about more than twenty, twenty-five, thirty data points about every voter, and so this allows you to do a lot of interesting stuff. Uh, and I will not go into how messages and campaigns have started because it's a very distinct talk by itself. but this is the essential strategy about how to do targeted messaging now coming back to it uh, there is also an adjustment process here that i will not go deep into because it will take too long a time for it so the way in which it works is that let us say you got this 1 by 3 um, and then uh, what really happened on the polling data is that when you when you when you go back to the evm and the vote and then uh, they do the totalizer totalizer machines uh, they don't actually actually Totalizer machines as a construct would have probably given much more anonymity for the secret ballot, but that doesn't exist no more. Uh, so what then you do is uh, you adjust. You say that okay, I'm supposed to get one by three, but I actually got two by three. Uh, maybe the neutral uh, whom I thought was uh, a neutral is probably not a neutral, but he has my leaning. So you just basically go back and adjust uh, the neutral status to one point zero uh, or one point. I mean to one point zero, and and so this is basically how you do it. and so even when you run uh, membership campaigns and all that kind of stuff remember the first and foremost thing they call, they talk about on the membership campaigns or even missed call campaigns is that please give me a missed call i mean at the end of it uh, no matter what your targeted messaging is uh, the mobile number is like an absolute absolute base and and so when people come and talk about jam jandan and aadhar and mobile they fundamentally forget about the fact that uh the m is the most crucial component uh, for political parties and what enables the m is what everything else does so if you find a whole bunch of farmers or a whole bunch of people not pretty unhappy with you six months before the elections when you're running ground polls you can always announce a direct subsidy for that kind of people and 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 the fact that you haven't done it so far doesn't mean anything but i actually expect these things to be much more operational going forward uh, because of the change in the voter id linking thingy right uh and then uh, the the beauty of targeted messaging is that uh you can pursue all of this simultaneously uh, sway the neutral suppress the component opponent make a leaner to vote i mean how uh, the magic in india has always been uh, whatsapp groups uh so you can look at a single example here i will just show the single example here just a minute so if you look at this message uh, there is something very interesting i mean for those who don't understand tamil i will just translate what it is it just says uh uh injustice injustice uh and then uh, the poor is being uh, denied their livelihood uh, and so on and so on but notice the amount of uh, exclamation marks here and if you understand tamil uh, a similar thing that we have seen in many many campaign messages it's exceptionally emotional and uh, so this is an example of how what uh, whatsapp messages are basically sent uh, i'll resume now going back so one is whatsapp groups uh, there are quite a bit of information about whatsapp groups and how they are managed again it's like a several hour talk i will not go into that uh, then of, of how will you get targeted messaging get done i mean you do what is called as a random uh, bombing via media then you do one to one canvassing uh, a similar kind of thing happened uh, in the farmer protest uh, there were quite a bit of uh, one to one canvassing but not by the people uh, who supported it by the people who opposed it Uh, so if you if you understand the modus operandi by combining data fusing it with databases and fusing it with with this panam pramukh kind of an architecture and then doing prior and back dating 
uh, you fundamentally get a pretty good idea on who's voting. And, uh, and this is primarily enabled by the totalizer machines um, and uh, so not the, the absence of totalizer machines. Um, and uh, so let's go back. What is the way to build targeted messaging? Uh, the way to build targeted messaging happens uh, via what is called as focus groups. Uh, so what you do is uh, you pick two or three persons uh, per polling booth uh, and then uh, run quite a lot of focus groups. You, you basically figure out a bunch of messages and the golden rule about messages is uh, it has to be emotional, directed and simple. And uh, uh, this is also uh, situated in a larger context called as the ON3C framework. Uh, and so this is an example of objective, narrative, context, campaign content. I will not go too deep into it. Uh, but but the simple fact of the matter is that I've seen this one to see framework and targeted messaging work many times over. Um, uh, it doesn't really matter. It is for the ruling party or the opposition. Uh, it has worked for incumbents. It, it has worked for opponents um, and so on and so on. Uh, so when you are facing this kind of a, a messaging problem, what do you do as an opposition? You run counter campaigns. You do uh, tap into data, data trade markets. Um, and sometimes it just so happens that the other side also leaks uh, information about their campaigns to you. Um, so this basically has become more mercenary uh, and uh, driven largely by political consultants. Uh, you would really want to look at what they are doing uh, in terms of their sophistication. It has increased by several notches in the last five years ever since we've been tracking this. Um, and so if you go back and uh, ask the first question, uh, I had met a TDP campaign consultant, um, and who, uh, when when the when the Seva Mitra thing uh, exploded, and uh, he explained to me like this, and he said, uh, "What do I do? Uh, the other side is bringing uh, guns uh, to a fight. Uh, I'm supposed to just go and fight them with bows and arrows." Uh, so we did what we had to do, uh, which is the explanation for the Seva Mitra thing. Uh, so in general, if you look at what has happened, is this is basically an escalation uh, of loss of privacy for citizens. And the very fact that everyone is doing it uh, doesn't mean that uh, it is actually right, uh, because we had a similar kind of an issue uh, during the paper uh, voting thing, uh, when ballot stuffing was pretty common and so on and so on, uh, et cetera, right? Uh, so the ECI did a lot of interesting stuff during these days in order to bring it down. So we are probably looking at something like that, uh, but uh, whether they would do it, I don't know, right? Uh, so the last step I would, uh, discuss and then we'll just move on to the conclusion. I think it should be right on time. Uh, so what, what last step is if you want to achieve until step four and you and you got into a place where uh, you are winning a lot of elections uh, one way or the other, uh, you use institutional control in order to entrench your advantage. Um, and so if, an example for that is, is the ongoing debate about the PDP where the government basically said, look, we don't want to give data about ourselves. So we just want to be exempt from all the PDP stuff. Right. I mean, URI is one of the examples. The government can basically exempt itself from the entire PDP law, uh, which fundamentally means it doesn't have to care about data protection anymore because it thinks that giving data about itself uh, and uh, telling people uh, and having more data about people is pretty good for it. For it, right? And of course, you this is the next thing, which is uh, pass laws which allow easy merge by common identifiers. And, and so that is really what the ECA other, uh, the other APIC card linking is all about. Uh, what is now actually uh, mostly done hush uh, by campaign consultants and political parties uh, by tapping into data rate markets and hack and leak or leak and buy and whatnot uh, is basically now being legalized. That's the way in which I would read it, right? Uh, so we are almost done. So just to think about if I were an operator, how do I do it? This is, this is how I would do it. And this is what is actually also happening on the field. Um, so. Think about this fact that voters have always been least informed and have the least powered by design. Uh, technical solutions like Aadhaar, blockchain, et cetera, don't address the information uh, asymmetry problem and hence worsen it. Uh, the easy availability of data also worsens power asymmetry as well, right? Uh, I think we're done. Questions? Okay. Uh, so I think one of the questions um, that was asked was about the decentralization of governance and what, what your idea around that might be? I don't know. I mean, we are supposed to be pretty decentralized, no? Isn't that the federal constitution kind of a thing? Yes, I mean, we don't have much context for that question. So. Yeah, um, I mean, we're supposed to be a lot more federalist and a lot more decentralized. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
what has happened of late is it has become exceptionally centralized so if you look if you look back what has happened um, most of the welfare schemes that are being run now are being pushed from the center uh, by taking money from the uh, states themselves which becomes a problem for the states because at the end of it uh, being the closest to the people uh, the states are responsible for delivery uh and the center usually writes down policies uh that's the way it is i don't know but even eci is supposed to be much more decentralized with state commissioners and so on and so on so that is with the with the with the ultra idea that thinking that is also becoming more centralized so what you have is a problem in the sense that uh, policies are being more uh, made in the center and implementation has to be done in the states but here both implementation and policies are basically made by the center which fundamentally means states don't uh, have much uh say not just on policy but also implementation which makes uh, governance much much worse overall um another question that we had was um don't the current or well imminent personal data protection laws exempt government agencies from processing personal data it seems like agencies uh, invested in voter id are they linking for targeted voter profiling for example in telangana are retroactively immune from legal consequences Yes. And in a similar vein, uh, what are we to do when legislation infringing on our rights are passed without any meaningful discussion and robust oversight mechanisms, especially with elections around the corner? Uh, well, I think uh, see we have a larger problem in general, uh, which is um, if you look at uh, all democracies all around the world, there had been severe uh, regression steps on the rights framework. Okay. uh what it fundamentally means is that uh, you have to think about rights framework as a means to ensure there is accountability built in into government itself now we are seeing increasingly the accountability checks being absent most of the government policies are actually not getting the results i mean which is supposed to be like you saw about gst and all the whole bunch of stuff um uh, what it really means i think is uh, if you look at historically uh, as a nation state we would be much poorer uh, much less competitive and uh, much more closeted uh, compared to the liberalization era that's really what is going to happen mm, well what is the outcome of that uh, things change uh, sometimes 50 years sometimes 20 years sometimes 5 years you don't know maybe when things change uh, and then maybe there is a there is a bend back towards the arc uh, but that may probably uh, take a while and until then you just have to endure that's usually how i've seen most of the democracies manage it like some never come back uh, some come back with a lot of limping some come back faster we don't know so i think related to that in case we, we do manage to move forward um there's a question that asks uh, since you spoke of unfair advantage and information asymmetry what would fair play and symmetrical access to information look like i think uh, there should not be access to information uh, by political parties uh, uh, and uh, that might be a harder one for the eci to think about but one thing they can definitely do is uh, stop publishing uh, polling booth data and use totalizer machines uh, people have talked about using totalizer machines uh, i mean the, the unfortunate problem i see is our courts are usually the worst place to litigate uh, any constitutional issue uh, particularly not just the supreme court and particularly if it is technology i think they just don't get it uh, so you, we have a larger problem in the way in which technology itself is understood in the country uh, forget about governance and i think uh, if you are able to manage at least the totalizer problem uh, by ensuring that at a polling booth level uh, oh, the number is not published i think that will go a long way towards removing the information asymmetry compared to what it is at least towards the voters like i i'm pretty sure political parties would be pretty unhappy about it but as voters they would be a lot more happier